The Lord is good and his mercy is in the Yes, he is good. He is good. Is he? Yes, he is. Yeah, he's really good. He's really good. The Lord is, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. We started back, uh, Pastor Young and I, we started back in, in uh, probably sometime in November, you know, really praying about what the Lord had for us this year, you know, and, uh -huh. and uh, what was laid up for us and, you know, what we're going to do, what, what, what was our, uh, what were the things that God had for us for this year, and it, it's actually yeah. continued on even past the first of the year, we're, yes. we're still kind of looking at those things, you know, what does, what is it that the Lord has for us, and What's he got for us to uh, to do this year? And it's interesting that we we sort of started out the year focused on Deuteronomy 29, you know, uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29, which said that the secret things belong to our God. Let me just turn around and read those. Read that again. Deuteronomy 29, 29. <clears throat> The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Hallelujah. The secret things of God, you know, belong to God, but then when he reveals them to us, then they're ours, and they belong to, to, to us, and then we can use them, and then we can, can, uh, can walk in those things. And uh, one the, the this verse came up, so has come up several times over the last few weeks, and is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. It's Ecclesiastes chapter eleven, and um, Ecclesiastes chapter eleven, verse one: Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall be. He that observes the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. So in the morning sow thy seed, in the evening will hold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether both shall be alike good. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be good. Hallelujah. The, uh, <clears throat> if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. There are some things that there are, there are, are times times and seasons for, and you don't know the times and seasons. It's yes. going to happen when the clouds are full of rain, and when the clouds are full of rain, it's going to start to rain. But until then, you just, and you know, as a farmer, I mean, I can I can remember uh, years where, where, where we had drought conditions, you know, mm -hmm. and we're looking at our crops, and our crops are just desperate for water, you know, and you'd see these black clouds coming, you know, and, uh, and then it wouldn't rain, you know, and, uh, uh, my conclusion had to be that the clouds weren't full of rain. You know, if they'd been full of rain, it would have rained. Mm -hmm. They would have emptied themselves, but they, but they didn't. But these particular passages, basically, the, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the north or to the south, it's going to be where it's going to fall. In other words, things are going to be what they're going to be. And there are things that you're not going to change because they're going to be what they're going to be. And it's going to happen when it's going to happen, and there are things that you might not be able to do to necessarily speed those things up. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds will not reap. In other words, the same situation that prevents you from sowing is the one that's going to prevent you from reaping. The situations that you allow to stop you from doing this will be the very situations that prevent you from reaping. In other words, you didn't sow because of this or because of that. You're not going to reap because of that, because if you don't sow, you don't reap. And so if there's some situation or some reason that caused you not to sow, it's going to be the same situation that caused you not to reap, because you didn't sow, you didn't reap. The powerful, powerful uh, uh, passages, you know. 
And uh, oh, hallelujah. When, uh, uh, and, and then the other verse, you know, because again, a, a key to the, uh, 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 the secret things is, uh, let's look at Matthew 22 and 37. And this is, this is the number one secret sauce that, that, that God has. It's the number one secret yes. that God, that, 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 that causes you to inherit the promises of God. Then one of them, who was a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him and saying, Master, what is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now the truth is that if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you're going to love other people. Because that's something that's resonant in the love of God. That's something that's contained there. So so the reality of this passage is that the most important commandment of all is that you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Because if you do that, then you'll be able to do the rest of them, and the rest of them will not follow. But if you don't do that, the rest of them won't follow anyway. So that's the first and the great commandment. It's the, it's the, the, the most important one. Now when he says, love God with all your heart, that the heart there means spirit. He's talking about your spirit. He's not talking about your natural heart. He's talking about your spirit. So you love God with all your spirit, with all your uh, soul, and with all your mind. In other words, the, the, the mind, the mind, will, and emotions represent the soulish side of man. And it's, that's the side of men that makes decisions and makes choices. Now the spirit man can rise up and the spirit man can cause you to change your mind about different things. But at the end of the day, you still make your decisions with your mind, you know. And your mind is not that again. Your mind was not sanctified. At the point where you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your spirit got born again, but your mind did not get born again. And you have to renew your mind by the decisions of your spirit, the decisions that you make with your spirit. So you love God with all your spirit, with your, your, your spirit man, loves God with all your spirit. But you have to decide in your mind, I'm gonna love God with all my mind. I'm gonna love God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. It's a decision that you make. It's the most important decision that any human being can make. Because it's the entrance way, it's the secret entrance way in to the things of God, to the supernatural realm of, of God, is, uh, is, is, is the love of God. And um, it's the key to the promises. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says that he has given us exceeding great and precious promises that we would be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, the promises, he's given us promises that would allow us to take dominion over the supernatural realm, that allow us to walk in the fullness of, of things that other people can't walk in, to walk in the fullness of the supernatural. And, and that's a gift that he has for us. And the promises that he's made uh, to us, the promises he gives that are in this book, because this is a book of promises, the promises that are there were given to us so that we would look like him, so that we could be like him, so that we could take our, our positions up like him. Yes. And so with that, that said in the background, I, you know, there's, there's some things that, you know, Pastor Gail and I have uh, just run into so, so often here over the last month or two that uh, they, they seem to be, be common things. And, um, you know, uh, we, we, you know we've, we've been praying about several different situations and, uh, uh, you know, there, there seems to be a, uh, just an incredible amount of sickness and disease out there right now. It's just running rampant out there, you know. And uh, people um, are just sick. And uh, some with life-threatening situations, some just sick, you know. 
some uh, grievously ill and some uh, a little bit. But we were talking about one particular situation, you know, Pastor Gail said, well, you know, she said they're, they're, they're taking the test that's required of PhD students, but they haven't taken the classes yet, you know? And I thought it was a great observation. I thought it was a, I thought it was a, it was a terrific observation because there are some things that your, your faith cannot handle right. unless your faith has been developed. And uh, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't attempt those things. That doesn't mean you wouldn't approach those situations. Yes. But there are people with, with you know, there, and this happens all the time, where there are people who, who all of a sudden come into a grievous illness, and, uh, and yet and their faith is just not developed to the point where they're going to be able to take dominion over grievous forms of illness. You know, it's one thing to have a cold, you know, that people are normally going to recover from. And it's another to have incurable, inoperable cancer. You know, those are, those are two very different right. things. Right. And the faith that is required, and both of those are healable, are yes. certainly healable by God. But the faith that is required to heal the one that's a grievous, inoperable a form of sickness and disease, the faith that's required to, to heal that is a much more uh, difficult kind of faith to achieve. And it doesn't come overnight. It has to be developed. The, the substance, you know, he, Hebrews 11, 1 says that uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. But that almost belies the point because the question is, what is the substance of faith? Well, the substance of faith, because that's what we want. We want to build our faith and we need to know the substance of faith. The substance of faith is the love and the trust of God. And the more you love God, the more you trust God, the more your faith is going to be developed, the more your faith is going to be built. But if you're not focused on the love and trust of God, see, the, the trust of God doesn't happen automatically either. You know, it, it, it develops as a result of studying the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Because you're not, you're, you're the same. Wait a minute, we still got it. We're still on. Now, now I can't see. There, there we go. I'll try to stand over here. So. Stand where you're supposed to be. Well, no. I, just, I can't see. There you go. I need to see their faces because if they're unhappy or they're the same, <laughs> I, need, I need to know it. I need to know that, that they feel like they're getting what they Yeah, they we can't see it. Their money's that's worth it. Yeah, that's right. No, no, no. I need to know that you're getting your money's worth here. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. So, the substance of faith is the love and the trust of God. And love and trust, just they just don't happen. You know? They just don't, or, or at least a, a perfected love. See, it's perfect love that casts out fear. It's not just love that casts out fear. It's perfected love that casts out fear. Or it's, it's love that is developed. It's love that's developed in a tr the trust of God. That's the love that casts out uh, fear. And that's the love that you want to accomplish. But that love is a mature love. And uh, somebody who, who just, you know, all right, I got born again yesterday, their love of God, quite frankly, just hasn't had time to develop. You know, it hasn't had time to mature. And so their love and their consequent trust of God is just not going to be as developed, let's say, as somebody else who's been, been working at it for years and years and years. So it's, it's, it's important to recognize if you're going to believe God for the supernatural, it's important, whether it's healing, whether it's provision, whether it's prosperity, whatever it happens to be, if you're going to believe God for the supernatural, it's important to recognize where you are on that spectrum you know, where you are on that, that continuum. Yes. And um, where are you on the love continuum? Because the other four, what, what I, I think are the other four elements of the secret things of God or, or, or what, what are the primary secret things of God, the other four pale in comparison to this one. You know, this is, this is the one that's critical. This is the one that if you're going to walk in those promises, this is the one 
that you uh, uh, this is the one you have to master the, the, the love of God and what does it look like if you if, what does it look like to love God you know what what would it look like because I think that you know we there's an old old expression and you, you probably every one of you have heard it again and again and again if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck it's a duck and that that is it Nowhere is that more true than the love of God, you know. Because if you love God, there's certain things that are going to happen. Yes. You know, certain, your, your behavior is going to begin mm -hmm. to be modified, you know. I remember when, uh, uh, when I, as, as a young young person growing up, you know, it was, was uh, uh, cute, you know, that, that all the guys would, would get together and we'd, you know, we could see who could cuss the best, you know, who, who, who knew the most four-letter words, you know, and who, who could use them the most, in the most arcane ways, you know, the most different things, you know. But when I got born again, my language began to change. And it didn't change overnight, you know. It, it, uh, and I, and the, there are just two examples. That, that's one example. Another one was I had a violent temper, you know, just a violent, violent temper. That um, and it, it it likewise didn't change overnight either, you know. But when I got born again and I began to pursue the things of God, yes. my temper got a little less, you know, uh, volatile. Let's say, and uh, uh, and it, it wasn't that I didn't get uh, didn't get angry about situations because I still do, you know. I still get upset. I still get angry, but I hide it pretty well, you know. And I learned how to, to hide it and to use my faith to be able to, to hide it. And uh, similarly with, with um, you know, disappointment and things like that. You know, disappointing things happen to everybody every single day, you know. But, you know, it's, it's not a measure of faith for you to show how disappointed you are, you know, or to show how... Uh, annoyed you are over particular situations, you know, and, and just the learning, the yes. disciplining of, yes. of, but I know, like, for example, you know, we're in the, uh, you know, we're in the construction business, and I'll, I'll walk up to a construction site, and I'll hear, that's not so much anymore, you know, because they're, they're primarily Hispanic now, you know, and I don't, I don't really understand what they're saying. <laughs> you know, they may be saying it, but I don't understand it, you know, completely. But it used to be that that I would walk up on the construction site and I'd hear the people from a distance just talking to each other, just filthy language, you know. But when I walk in the building, it stopped, you know. And as I'm walking out of the building, as I get about 20 yards away, I'd hear it start up again, you know. But, but there was something about, you know, the when I would walk into that building, the people yes, knew respect. something was going to change. You know that, that they were going to they were going to guard their speech. And, and yes. I have a guy who who uh, works for me now. He's worked for me for years and years, and uh, and he just he has a way about him that he was just so so engrossed in in using certain words. You know that he'll still slip. You know and he'll say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I meant you." You know and he'll. And, because he, he recognizes, you know, and I'm sure he doesn't apologize for using that language around other people, but he always does, you know, when he's uh, uh, around me. And the, the, the point is that as I begin to grow in the grace of God, if you will, as I begin to, to move in my love and trust of God, it began to change my speech, it began to change my attitudes begin to change. And yes. I still get angry about situations and I still sometimes say things I shouldn't say and you know and all everybody, I think everybody does. Um and and, and, and I certainly do. But I'm a whole lot better about it than you know than I, I, I used to than than I used to be. And uh and, and it's because I've allowed the Spirit of God to work on the inside of me. You know, well, the same spirit of God that works on your speech yes. and works on your temper and yes. works on those things also works on your ability to believe, yes. you know, and your ability to to call forth those things that be not as of there. See, the, the Romans chapter 4 talks about the faith of Abraham. 
And the Bible says that if ye are Christ, if ye belong to Christ, if ye are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs of the blessing. In other words, we were heirs of the Abrahamic covenant. And we can use the tools that Abraham used. And the principal tool that Abraham used was calling forth those things that be not as though they were. It is your number yes. one tool yes. for, the, yes. for use in the supernatural. Mm -hmm. If you're going to walk in the supernatural power of God, in the supernatural, yes. uh, uh, in, in the belief that the supernatural belongs to you, then you're going to use that tool. Now, it, what it says is, it says that Abraham was fully persuaded. He was not moved by circumstances, right. but he was fully yes. persuaded that what God had said he could do, yes. or what God had promised he was fully able to perform. Let me just, let me just turn to, to that uh, passage, because it's, it's one that, that any Christian who is uh, hoping to walk in the supernatural power of God, whether that be healing, yes. whether that be yes. deliverance, or yes. whatever that happens to be, this is a tool that you have to master the use of. Yes. 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 Not just yes. learn how to use yes. it, but you want to master the use yes. of this tool. And it's, it's in Romans chapter 4. And it says that, uh, uh, let's start at verse uh, oh, uh, 17. As it is written, I made thee a father of many nations, who quickened it, a God who quickened the dead, and call those things that be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope? Yeah. What does that mean? Who against hope? Yeah. See, there's two kinds of hope. There's a natural hope and there's a spiritual hope. Spiritual hope means, the word that's translated hope, it means the confident expectation that the thing that you're believing for is going to come to pass. So what this is saying here is he had a supernatural hope he had a spiritual hope that override natural hope. Where there was no natural hope, yes. he had a spiritual hope that yes. took dominion over that. Yes. See, the Bible said he was 99 years old, you know, when, when, it, when Isaac was conceived, and Sarah was 90. And, you know, people of that age can't conceive a child. So there was no hope. There was no natural hope. But he had a spiritual hope that was founded on what God had said. And he believed against that natural hope. He believed in God's promise. He believed that God's promise was able to transcend natural hope. And so he called forth that thing. He called forth that thing that be not as though it was. And then it says in verse 19, it says, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now it's dead, as a... Uh, uh, when he was about 100 years old, not of the deadness of Sarah's womb. In other words, he didn't consider natural circumstances. He was, he was, yes. he had a spiritual expectation yes. Yes. that transcended natural hope. He had a confident spiritual expectation that what God said he could do, he could do. And what God said he was going to do, he was going to. And he was being not weak in faith. He didn't consider the circumstances. He didn't consider his body. He didn't consider Sarah's body. In fact, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded that God was able to do what he promised. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. That meant... He was going to get what he believed for. That meant, that meant he was going to get it. He called forth that thing that be not as though it was. So that's a powerful, powerful passage. And it's the single most important tool that the Christian has to walk in the presence of the supernatural. To, to be able to call forth those things that be not as, as, as though they were. Now, when a person gets born again, they've not really developed in that. You know, and in fact, when a person first gets born again, they're not really developed in the spiritual forces at all. And all the, there are other spiritual forces as well. There's a spiritual force of faith. There's taking authority over fear and not receiving fear. You know, 
and, and being able to cast out devils and demons and, and spiritual forces that come against you. There's all kinds of spiritual forces that you're not developed in. You know? And so the truth is, you've got to begin to learn those things. You've got to begin to do. And the church is supposed to be the place that teaches those things. It's supposed to be the church. Now, I'll grant you that in a lot of churches in in America today, they're they're focused on whatever it is they decide to be focused on, and they're not necessarily focused on communicating and discipling their people in the use of spiritual weaponry and spiritual tools. But that was the way that it was supposed to be anyway. But that doesn't alter the fact that the church was supposed to be was supposed to be in that place. And but the truth is that if you're like what 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 happened to Pastor Gail and I is we recognized you know we 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 decided that the that the answers we needed were in the Word of God because we you know we as a as a as a young couple that was uh, had children had a, a household full of children and a, and a stack of bills in the mail you know and uh, in every type of situation the children you know we had five small children, and somebody was sick all the time, you know? And so you'd go to the doctor, and, and the kids that weren't sick, they'd get it in the doctor's office, you know, and all of a sudden. So there was a constant combating of sickness and disease, you know? And we realized we had to be able to supernaturally take authority over sickness and disease and be able to take authority over that which was coming against our family, that which was coming against our children. Similarly with, 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 with finances, you know, that there were issues that would come uh, against our finances, and we had to be able to have dominion and authority over those situations. We realized that our answer was in the church, that our answer was in the Word of God. It wasn't just the church. We, we started going to camp meetings. We would, we would make it a point to yes. separate ourselves yes. for a few days at a time and, and go to, yes. to uh, camp meetings of yes. people whose opinions we trusted, whose, yes. whose word we trusted. In other words, what we decided to do was we were gonna, we were gonna take the classes. We were gonna learn, yeah. you know, we were gonna develop ourselves. If that was where the answer yes. was, we were yeah. gonna begin to Amen. develop ourselves in Amen. that. And, uh, and I just, I, I, I wanna encourage you yes. uh, in that, that, that here's, here's the question you should ask yourself. Yes. Is if I'm going to love the Lord God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, what would that look like? You know, what does right. that look like? In other words, it's not something I'm just going to ignore. I'm going to keep living my life just as I lived it before. I'm going to keep doing the things that I did just as I did before. You begin to make changes. And for example, one one change we, we made was we would uh, we would go on vacation or go if we were going to go away for a few days. We'd go away on weekends, you know, and we'd miss church, and we realized. You know, if we really wanted to know, if we wanted to develop ourselves in spiritual giftings and spiritual forces, we had the wrong order. Yes. That we needed to yes. be in church. We needed to be in church more than we needed to be Amen. anywhere else. Right. And so we decided we weren't going to yes. do that anymore. If we were going to go away. We'd go away Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Yes. But we would not be gone on Sunday. Yes. That we'd make sure that we were we were in the place where they were dispensing. And we had the privilege of going to a good church. And of yeah. course, it, w it was a very good church that, yeah. that dispensed, you know, uh, knowledge of the Word. And they, 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 they taught the Word, and it was excellent. But we decided that if we were going to love God and we were going to pursue the things of God, that we needed to make it a point that we were going to be where they were teaching at so that we could learn yeah. those things. Yeah. And... Um, when we uh, when we got over to the uh, uh, ministry, we uh, 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 we had it happen a couple of times where just weird things happened, and we'd go away, and we were going to travel back really early on Sunday morning, get back to church, and weird things would happen, and, and we didn't make it. You know, yes. we were uh, we were in New York one morning, we were getting ready to leave at six o'clock in the morning. We'd be home by nine o'clock. You know, we'd be, be 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 ready to go to church, and a guy drops dead on the tarmac. You know, and so they held the plane up for about three hours, and the guy just had a heart attack and and and, and died right there. And it's our plane, yeah. you know. We we were coming back from New York one morning, and and uh, it was a beautiful day. We left at six o'clock in the morning. It's an absolutely gorgeous day in New York, but there were tornadoes and storms over Florida, 
and they diverted our plane. Right. And we missed church because our plane was diverted over to Orlando. And that was the day we said, that's it, we're never doing that again. Right. You know, we're never going to travel. We're, we're always going to be there by Saturday afternoon, you know, yeah. so that we can, you know, be in the church because it's too important for us to, to be in the church. And, you know, I listen to people tell me why they couldn't get to church or why they can't do this or why they can't do that all day long. And I realized it wasn't important to them, you know. And here's the, here's the, here's the message I'd like to relate to you. It is important to you to be able to use spiritual forces. Right. You're going to have to change your behavior. Right. You're going to have to let other things go. You know, what we used to do is we, we had a family visiting. You know, our family would right. visit. They'd come uh, right. And we'd say, look, you just go on in the house. And we're going to go to church. When church is over, we'll be home. Right. You, know, you go on in the right. house and make yourself right. sit down with the dogs, you know, play with the right. dogs yeah. and do whatever. Yeah. You know? That's right. That's uh, right. We always had dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we'd say. We'd say, look, we're, we're just not going to be there. Right. Or something would, would, would be happening or on Wednesday nights. Our deal was we don't do anything else on Wednesday night. You know, I mean, there's, there's Wednesday night, they have Wednesday night service. And uh, we're not going to do anything else on Wednesday night. And that, that was it. And so we made a quality decision that we were going to pursue the things of God. People don't make those quality decisions. And as a result, they don't get the promises of God operational and full. I want to show you, I, you know, I've gone into this. This is a, 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 a it's a second Samuel. Look at second Samuel 15. This is um, this is when uh, David is uh, he's king of Israel, and Absalom, his son, is trying to uh, take over the kingdom and trying to uh, uh, basically overthrow the kingdom. And um, and so David's been told now that Absalom's trying to overthrow the kingdom. And let's look at verse thirty-one, Matthew, Second Samuel, chapter fifteen, verse thirty-one. It says, and one told David, saying, and uh, a uh, 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 hip hop, I don't know what it's name, hip hop, Mr. Hip Hop, you know, <laughs> no, Mr. Hip Hop, uh, was among the conspirators with Amazon. Now that he was one of David's trusted advisors, he was one of his uh, his counselors, his his uh, whatever you call him, the, you know, one of his trusted trusted advisors and counselors, and. One told David, saying, this trusted advisor of yours is among the conspirators without Absalom. And David said, I want you to notice, notice how David responds. Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Mr. Hip Hop into foolishness. Turn it in. He doesn't get all shook up. He doesn't get all worried about it. See, because he knows his God. And he knows the power yeah. of his God. And he's walked yeah. with his God. And he's seen his God do things for him. Yeah. And he realized, I don't need to get all worried about this. I don't need to get all, all worried about it. I'm just going to ask God, turn the circumstances around. Change the circumstances. Uh, change the circumstances around. Now, look over at 2 Samuel 17 and verse 14. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said the counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. Look at that. God did what David asked. David didn't get upset about it. He didn't get all cranked up. He didn't get all worried. He just asked him, just confuse the counsel of, 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 of us find hip hop. Let's confuse the counsel of Mr. Hip Hop. And that's exactly what God did. And here we see a couple of verses later, God did exactly what. See, that's the objective. That's where you want to get to with your faith. That I know God. 
that I've spent time in God's presence. I know how he responds. And I can ask him to do they this particular situation, are. and he'll do it for me. Yes. And yes. you don't get all worked up. You don't get all excited. You know, we, we got, we've gotten that way with storms and hurricanes and things like that. We don't fear storms. We, we, God gave us authority over it. And it's happened so many times that God has, 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 has turned the storms the other way. That we have a confidence that he's going to do that. But it's not just storms, but there's other things that God has done for us that God has, has responded. But what happened was we loved him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And all of the other things, that's what they flow out of. And here's, here's the question. If you really want, if you want to be in that group that walks in the supernatural, that receives the supernatural promise of God, you need to ask yourself, you know, what would it look like if you love God? What would it look like if you were trying to develop yourself in the love of God? You know, when, uh, uh, when, when Pastor Gail and I got married, I wanted her to know that I loved her, you know. And so it was important to tell her that I loved her. It was important to do things that showed her that I loved her. It was important to talk to her. It was important to spend time with her. It was important to, to do things with her and so forth. It's the same way with God, you know. <clears throat> if you say you love God, but you never get in His presence, and you never read His Word, and you never spend time in prayer, and you don't ever go to church and fellowship with other believers and things like that. Well, if it walks like a duck, you know, and it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck, you know. And so, if you're working on your love of God, it's going to look a certain way. And if you're not, it's going to look a different way, you know. And the question is, you have to decide which one you, you want to be. See, the other thing is, like I was telling you about some of the different things, we put God's, we put being in God's presence first. And when we would go on, you know, vacation, we just didn't do a lot of vacations that didn't somehow involve going to a camp meeting somewhere or going to, to you know, put ourselves in a place where faith could grow, you know, where, where our faith was going to be fed, where yeah. it was going to be grown. Because what did you put first? You know, if you love God, you put that first. And you, you, you want to see that love, love, love yes. grow. There were just certain decisions we make. We realized that in order for God to touch our finances, yes. that he had to have control of our finances. Yes. He had to be able to ask us for things, and we had to be able to respond. That was the deal. Amen. And if God said, I want you to do this, we had to do it. And you could, to, to argue with him over, well, uh, you know, God, I don't have this, or God, I don't have that. You know, you realize it doesn't work. Amen. You know? It, it, you know, the, the question is, are you willing to allow God to control your finances? Because mm -hmm. if God is going to prosper your finances, yes. he needs to be able to do things that are going to cause them to prosper. You. you know, when, when Pastor Guy and I first got married, we hadn't been married very long, maybe, maybe a, I don't know, a month or so, two months, something like that. And we had an argument over uh, money. And it was just, it was nothing, you know, what whatever it was, I don't I don't even remember, you know, it was so insignificant, you know. And uh, uh, and, and it was it was not 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 a significant amount of money. Anyway, you know, and I just I felt so bad about it, you know. I just I was just I because because I knew that you know I had hurt her with my words and I just I felt so bad about it, you know. And so I began to pray about it. I said, God, you know, what, what do I do about it? that? And God said, don't speak to her about money. Don't speak to her about what she said, what she's, what she paid, what she, what she's spent. He said that's that's not your job, you know. He said your job is you believe me for more. And uh, he said well, whatever it is that she spends, if she gets out of line, I'm gonna talk to her. I'll handle it with her. And uh, and uh, he said but you don't talk to her about. It. You believe me for more, and I'll handle the more, and I'll handle her. And uh, to, to this day, now that was 30 years, that was over 30 years ago. To this day, we rarely ever talked about money, rarely ever. And we've, we've never argued over money. And um, in, in all these years, I don't think we've argued over it at all. And uh, we've rarely ever discussed it, you know. 
And uh, oh, I did what God said to do. What I didn't know at the time was that she and I, oh, when you first get married, you are one flesh, but it doesn't look like that. It doesn't feel like it. You know, it takes a little while to, to, to get there, you know. And, uh, but as we grew, we would become one flesh. And there's places that she would go where she would have a sense that I needed to sow something. And if she had to call me and check with me, I wasn't in the same place. I, I didn't know. I, I wouldn't be able to, to immediately get in the same frame of mind as, as she was. And so what God was trying to do with us was to bring us to the place where he could speak to her to sow something in a place where I wouldn't be and she'd do it. And I wouldn't, you know, say, well, why did you do that? You know, and, yes, uh, yes, and, and, yes, and, and that sort of yes, thing. Yes, yes. And uh, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I had no idea Thank you, that that's what God was really working on. But he's working on the togetherness because... You know, there, there are things that there are seeds that she sown that I reap the benefit of. And there are seeds that I sown that she reap the benefit of as well. And we want God to be able to do that. you got to give God permission to be able to, to, to do that. And what God said was, okay, I'll, I'll take it. But, you know, here's what you do. This is, this is your part. Because everything God does has his part and your part. And for us, that was it was such a extraordinary thing that, uh, that God has done. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, as, as we talked about when we first got married, you know, love and trust of each other right. is built over time. You know, it doesn't necessarily always, you, you know, you can't just get married and, and all of a sudden you have a deep and abiding trust in the other person. It just doesn't work that way. You know, it just takes some time. And, uh, uh, but that was part of it for us. You know, was God wanted us to develop that, and God wanted us to develop to the place where we trust. But the other thing is, the love and trust of God takes time too. You know, it just, you don't just automatically love God. You don't just automatically trust God. It has to be a decision that you made that this is where I'm going. You know, and God will partner with you. He'll participate with you, and He'll set up the situations for you to develop you in love and trust. Let me say that again. He will set you up. He will set up those situations for you, for you to be able to develop your love and your, your trust of God. Oh, hallelujah. See, if you had decided that I'm going to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, you'd be looking for opportunities to show Him your love. See, that's the way it was when, when we got when, when, when we got married is I wanted to look for opportunities to show her that I loved her, you know. Yes. Um, yes. And she likewise wanted to look for opportunities to show me. Well, we realized we need to show God. You know, we want to find opportunities to do things for God, you know, to yes. please God. Sometimes it was, uh, sometimes it involved finances yes. and, and God would develop us in those things. Yes. Most of the time it wasn't finances, but a lot of times it was. But God will develop you in those things. When God knows that he has your permission to develop you in the situation, then he'll do it. Then he's, then he's free to do it. God won't violate your right of choice. You know, just like he's not going to make you get saved. He's not going to make you choose to, to serve him. He wants you to. He's not going to make you do it. And it's similarly, he's not going to develop you in the grace of God. He's not going to develop you in the spiritual forces. Unless you give him permission to, 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 to do that. So you want to make sure that if you really love God, that's what you're going to do. You're going to look for opportunities to obey. We had, uh, when uh, um, the first time we ever heard anybody talk about first fruits, about the sowing of first fruits, he even said, the guy even said, it was a John Evans Amy, uh, who, who was really back at that time, he's one of the only people really teaching about biblical finances. And what he said was, he said, just Put God to the test. This is what God said. He said, if you, you know, if you put me first, Jesus. if you put me first in situations and you sow first fruits on situations, I'll be able to do things that you Thank wouldn't you otherwise Jesus. do. And we thought, well, okay, we're going to put, well, let's put God to the test. And he did, my goodness, that he, he did the most extraordinary things 
as a result of first fruit seeds that we sow over situations. So we, we, uh, and you've heard us tell those stories at the end of some time, don't worry, but then it won't. But things that would happen that God would touch our harvest in this, or he touch our harvest in that, you know, Amen. and and magnify it so that it would, would just, uh, our harvests would explode, you know, in, in ways we had no capacity to believe. That, uh, and it could have ever been like that, but God would cause it to do because we were faithful to do first things. See, what God is looking for is for, for he, He's looking for you to obey Him, and that's true. Uh, in, in, the, in the second, uh, first Samuel, it talks about to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. And I wrote that down. It's first thing of 15 and 22. No, we're, we're, we're close here anyway. Let's just turn over there. First thing of 15 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken is better than the fat burns. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected, he was talking about Saul, he also rejected him from becoming king. But to obey is better than sacrifice. But to love is the highest form of obedience. To obey God because you love him. To obey God because you want to please God is more important than obeying God because you want God to do something for you. See, the question is, why did you obey? You know, I mean, we obey yeah, because it's the right thing to do. And we obey because it's better than sacrifice. But the most important reason you want to obey God is because you love God and because you trust God. And that's how trust is built. That's how your, 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 your trust uh, goes up. Now, what we found is, as you begin to do that, God will begin to set you up in situations. You know, He'll begin to provide circumstances. He'll begin to make things happen for you. You had no idea how how did that happen? How could those things happen? God will make things happen for you. He'll set you up in situations. And you know, we've been talking about hidden riches and secret places. That's how you get in the door to to hidden riches and secret places. And, and hidden riches, they might not necessarily be monetary things. They might be, you know, they, there's a lot of things that are hidden riches that are not monetary things. In fact, the greatest things in life are generally non-monetary things. But God will set you up for those things. And those things are the hidden things. They're hidden riches. But God will set you up to get those things. But it's not just your obedience that makes that happen. It's your love, it's your obedience out of love. Oh, hallelujah. Say this after me. Say, Lord God, I love you. I love you with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. See, the Bible says, because it was, because first he loved us. I mean, he loved us first. That's why we love him back. Because he loved us first. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord God. We bless you, Lord God. Anyway, if you made one New Year's resolution, I love God. God, I want to love you more. I want to love you more. What would it look like, God? What do I need to do to develop my love for you? What do I need to do to pursue my love for you? Hallelujah. You will not be sorry. <laughs> you, folks at home, you will not be sorry. Amen. Hallelujah. As Pastor was speaking tonight, um, Matthew 25 talks about the talents. And God has given us all talents. And when we, when we went to um, that church, um, when we first began to go to uh, that, that uh, countryside Christian all those years ago, 
the first Sundays we were there, it was there should be an expectation that God's going to speak through the mouthpiece, that God's going to deliver to you what you need to be fed in the place that you go. And so when we went there, our expectation was that God was going to speak to us. The first uh, few weeks, he talked about covenant. And here we named our church covenant. Amen. When we went to the training center, he taught, we, we took spiritual authority. Pastor's talking about spiritual authority tonight. And we, we got a hold of honor, of spiritual, and, and understanding this life of David and Absalom, Saul, David, and Absalom. And, and we, we got an understanding of how you walk in spiritual authority and how you, how you uh, learned to honor authority and spiritual authority and submit to it. And, and so God can give you more. And uh, so those were a couple things. And ministry development, that was another class we took. And how to develop ministries and what do we do in, in our lives now is we help people to develop their ministries. And so God's plan for each of us is, is a, he's always working in our lives to bring us uh, to his perfect place in, in himself and, and joy. And so in Matthew 25, it says, when they share their talents, when they gave of their talents, they entered into the joy of the Lord. And so it was not work. If it's work for you, then if you're doing something wrong, it should be joyful. We do this as unto the Lord. We are doing things as unto Jesus. And, and we have had so many wonderful situations happen to us that we were able to partner with people and we were able to serve people and we've been able to, and we still serve people today and we have been able to enter into the joy of the Lord, amen? And so it's the joy of the Lord to do these things. This isn't heavy. This is it's this joy that you get in it. And, and so that's what happened when they were faithful with their talents. And so God doesn't, when you give something to him, when you give of yourselves, he does not just take it and not do something and give you something, something back. But I tell you, we love him more. I love the Lord more today than yesterday. And I want to know more about him. I, I, it never gets old with Jesus. It's like with Pastor Kevin. He's, uh, he's always getting better. Amen. He's not getting worse. He's getting better, just like knowing the Lord. And so we encourage you. He wants you to enter into joy in, in, your, in your pursuit of him and your fulfillment of the plan that he has for you. And so we just thank you for being with us, Pastor. And uh, thank you for good Great, great word. There's a great book. It's called The Tale of Three Kings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, it's a, we, don't, we don't really recommend all that many books, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you're going to read one book, it ought to be the Bible. You know? mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you're going to spend lots of time reading, it ought to be the Bible we read. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. You know, you, you, you know we, we read business things. We read things that help us in our businesses and help us be be trained and be developed and so forth. But pleasure reading, you know, ought to be the Bible. But uh, A Tale of Three Kings is a great book. It's about authority. You know, the three kings were David, Absalom, and Saul. And, uh, uh, but it's a great, it's a great book. you read ever read that book? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book. It's about spiritual authority. Yes. And uh, the development of spiritual authority. Yes. And it's a short book you read about an hour, you know. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And just like, you know, we talked about uh, High Speed on High Places is a wonderful book, you know. And there are, there are a few books that are really like that, that just put in, in further who you are to, to read those books. But Tale of Three Kings is a, is a, is a, would be a great one to, uh, to get to and, uh, and, uh, and read. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I, I'll give you a, a, one of the things that I feel like I believe that this was of God. This was something that, that God began to develop me in. 
was the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And, uh, and, and really, to begin to pray over whatever situation it is that you're blamed for, whether you're, if you're sick and you need healing, or you've got to pray for somebody else, or pray for another right. situation, ask for wisdom first. Because the Bible says that wisdom is a principal thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I've got a, a, a yes. business problem, right. I need wisdom. You know, not just natural wisdom, yes. not the wisdom of, of people. And there's nothing wrong with seeking out the counsel of people, but the wisdom of God is the principal type of wisdom that you want. Because the Bible says that, that you know, godly wisdom descends from above. And it's pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's yes, easy to be entreated without partiality or hypocrisy. And it's sown in peace with the fruits of those who make peace. Yes. And so uh, uh, yes. godly wisdom is to be desired. Yes. And uh, the Bible says that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. Yes. So in other words, the seed to receive godly wisdom is just to ask for it, is to seek it out. Sure. And I encourage you in that uh, because it, it, you know, for, for me, it, it really has, has helped develop my prayer life to seek wisdom first. You know, God, I want wisdom over this problem. Now, now what, what am I looking at here? Give me wisdom over Thank the you. situation because the answer is not always what you think it is. You know, the, the situation or the true situation that you're looking at is not always what you thought it was. And wisdom will help you discern those those things so God has, you know we want wisdom over so you ask for wisdom because and you see what it does if, if God said that wisdom and this is a, this is in the pursuit of the love of God this is a critical principle that to pursue what God said over what you thought over what people said over the opinions of other people what did God say it honors God to put his opinion first. It honors God to seek his opinion above other things. It honors God when you say, well, let me see what God said about that. Mm -hmm. You know, what did God say? You want to know that, you know. But what you want even more than that, you want God to see that you want to know that. You want God to know that you want to know what he said. Well, hallelujah. Father, we love you. We bless you. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for your love shed abroad towards us. And we worship and praise you. And we give you thanksgiving and honor and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. Next week, um, you want to watch your talk about next week? Uh, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'm going to do healing and healing school. I haven't done healing school for a while. Instead, uh, usually I do uh, five days. But we're going to do it on Monday, two sessions on Monday at 10.30 and 12.30, and two sessions on Tuesday, 10.30 and 12.30, and then on Wednesday at 10.30. And we will be bilingual, so we're going to do this and have it out so that the so they can go to the Spanish community as well. So Sister Irene's going to help me, and she's going to come and translate for us. And I'm so excited about so many, like we said, so many people have been sick. We prayed for so many people that have been very, very, very sick. And um, just and, and even at the nursing home today, they uh, I walked past the sign that said you need to put masks on. <laughs> And I'm like, why do a lot of people have masks on in here? <laughs> but, but there's, a, again, there's a, a, a concern right now for respiratory and COVID-like symptoms. So, so like in the nursing homes, they're, they're kind of at requesting that you wear masks. And um, anyway, so by God, we prayed uh, and prayed for the people and they received their healing today. But uh, we're going to talk about how to take the word and how to stand on the word for your healing. I'll talk to you about covenant, how the Lord gave me the, the way I teach on healing. He gave it to me when I began this a lot of years back. And so we'll go through some of those things, just how to take your covenant, how to understand covenant that you, the covenant that you have, how to receive your healing. And everybody starts somewhere. And I didn't learn this until um, later in life um, that I could take the word of healing. And God has healed me many times. 
calling on the name of Jesus. So I'll talk to you and give you some of the testimonies of how I received my healing. And uh, he's still healing me. Uh, even, even this week, I saw a snake coming at me and rebuked it in the name of Jesus. You know, things, you know, it was a snake in the spirit. I saw a spiritual snake trying to come at me and bite me. And, and so there are spirits that are trying to, they will, they're looking to get on you. And sickness and disease is a spirit. It is a snake. It does want to bite you, but you must resist being full in faith. And so we'll talk about some of those things. I pray that you'll be with us um, and make it a, t a time, if you can't be with us, that you will watch some of those teachings on healing um, at, at a later time. Thank you for being with me. Uh, us tonight, and we will see you on Sunday. God bless.